Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So from today we are starting with the revision lecture series for CA intermediate examinations, which are going to happen in May 24 and November 24, right? So this series is applicable for the students who are appearing in May 24 or November 24 examinations. So in this series, I'll be discussing with you all the chapters of the taxation paper. First, we'll start with income tax and then we'll go to GST, right? Here, I'll be discussing each and every chapter with you. In fact, every topic, which is as per our syllabus, as per our, our CA study material, I'll be discussing everything with you, right? So uh, let's start with the very first chapter of uh, income tax, that is basic concepts of income tax. And uh, you can, I'll be using my book, my handwritten book, and you can also download this book. It is available. It's a very beautifully crafted book and uh, it, it covers all your topics, which is as per your syllabus, right? As per the new uh, course, which is applicable and it covers all the amendments also, which is applicable for our 2024 exams, right? So you can visit our website. This is rajatmugha.com and there is a download section over there, right? So uh, there you will find a book, uh, go to CA intermediate part and there is a link of the book. You can easily download this. It is downloadable in PDF format. Okay. So let's start uh, with basic concepts of income tax. And this chapter is introductory. So I'll be uh, starting with very elementary topics, very basic topics. What is tax? Uh, and there are two different types of taxes, direct tax, indirect taxes. What are the tax rates applicable? Who is an assessee? What is the assessment here? So I'll be discussing those points over here in this first chapter. Okay. So we all understand what is tax. Why government of any country needs tax? Because of economic development. We understand that uh, if any economy needs to get developed, so their education sector must be strong their health sector, their infrastructure, they should have a good infrastructure in the country and defense system must be strong. So for, for making these things strong, for uh, developing a nation, we require funds. Government of, government of any country required fund and so is India. We require funds. So there are different sources of revenue for the government and taxation is one of the major source of revenue. So we can say that tax is a revenue to the government, right? It's a revenue for the government and they levy taxes on various goods, various services that we know as GST and also on uh, people's income. If they are earning, then they have to pay taxes. So taxes are fees charged by the government on products, income or activity that we understand. And we also know that there are two different types of taxes, direct tax and indirect tax. See, this is introductory lecture. So that is the reason I'm starting with very basic topics. So direct tax and indirect tax. What is direct tax and indirect tax? You easily understand this. Direct tax is that here you just have to remember two things. One is called burden of tax and other is called collection of tax. And if it is on the same person, then we call it as a direct tax. So we understand if the burden of tax, burden of taxes is that who will bear this tax, who will bond this tax, from whose pocket it will actually go. So that is called burden of tax and if burden of tax and collection of tax, collection of tax means government will collect from whom. So if these both the things are from the same person, we call it as a direct tax and income tax is a classic example. See, for example, if I am earning income, then I have to pay taxes, burden of taxes on my pocket. I have to pay tax from my pocket, right? And will the government or income tax department officers will go to my neighbor's place or to any of my relatives place to collect the tax? The answer is no, they will come to me. I have to pay tax because I, if I am, will not be paying tax, they will be sending me notices. They will be um, applying uh, penalties and other provisions also to collect tax from me. So pocket from whose pocket it is going from my pocket and they will call, also collect it from me, right? So this is both the things are on the same person that is for direct tax. But if these things are from different person, burden of taxes on some other person and collection of taxes going uh, is going to happen from some other person, then we call it as an indirect taxes. A uh, classic example is GST. 
uh customs duty is also one of the example which you will learn in your uh, ca finals and there was a text there in fact there it was not was it was is because excise duty is not completely abolished still there are some goods rarely there are some goods left on which excise duty is also applicable so excise duty is another example of indirect taxes so uh, in indirect taxes let's say if you go to market if you purchase any product or if you purchase any services then you have to pay that amount for example you go to uh, a restaurant or you go to a pizza hut or dominos you purchase a pizza for you and the pizza cost is 400 plus 50 rupees as taxes so you have to pay 450 rupees so who is bearing the burden from whose pocket it is going from the consumer pocket they have to pay 400 for the pizza also and 50 rupees for the taxes also correct so 450 is going from the consumer pocket but will government will collect this 50 rupees from that consumer with that consumer has to go somewhere and deposit this tax no he will simply pay to that restaurant owner or uh, that restaurant manager he will pay and government will collect from someone else right uh, in gst we know that it, it is a supplier generally in case of forward charge and reverse charge that we will discuss in gst so burden of tax and collection of tax is on different person it is indirect taxes right okay this is uh, and i tell you that this is just for your knowledge purpose not very important for examination purpose these things but this is this can come in your mcq you should remember this article 245 what does this article says it says that no tax can be collected unless and until there is a law there should be a law without law if you are collecting taxes that is illegal so in income tax we have income tax act 1961 in GST, we have GST Act, uh, CGST, SGST and all. We have 2017. So there must be a law. If there is no law, you cannot collect. Government cannot collect tax. This is written in Article 245. This is important. Second important thing is, you should know about those three lists. List 1, List 2, List 3. Remember, List 1 is called Union List. Uh, list 1, let me explain you. We have list one, we have list two, we have list three. List one is uh, your uh, union list, list two is your state list, and list three is concurrent list. Only once it has it has been asked in examination, although not very important, but still it they can ask you. So you should know about these three lists. This list are mentioned in Schedule Seven. Schedule Seven of uh, constitution of india so list one it contains uh, all the activities which are governed by central government so here union government that is central government there are different uh, points written over there and one of the point is 82 here income tax is written that on income government can collect tax so what we call these points we call these points as entry so this is entry number 82 this you should remember this can come in your examination in mcq so entry 82 says that central government has power to collect taxes on the person's income. If they are earning income, central government has the power. State government cannot collect tax on income tax. Right. So please tell me income tax is a central law or it is a state law. It is a central law. Right. It is not a state law. It is central law all over India. It is applied uniformly. Right. And entry number 82 says that you can collect taxes on income except agriculture income. On agriculture income, we cannot collect tax because that power is given to state government. There is in list 2, there is entry number 46. There it is written that on agriculture income, state government can collect tax. Although they don't collect it, but still that power is with the state government. It is not with uh, the central government. So we don't collect tax on agriculture income. We say that agriculture income is exempt. But yes, you will also learn in your partial integration. We don't tax on agriculture income, but we take that agriculture income into account while calculating tax that we will learn in our agriculture portion when I'll explain partial integration with you. That is important for examination. Okay, coming back. So you should remember entry 82 that is in your uh, union list. Second is what are the components of income tax law? See, income tax law, whenever you have to understand income tax law, you cannot uh, understand income tax act in isolation. Income tax act is just one component. Income tax act 1961 is just one component of income tax law. And there are also various other things which you should know if you would like to uh, have a knowledge on entire income tax law. So second thing is annual finance act. Annual finance act 
every year there is a budget and in that budget session uh, finance minister presents a finance bill which later on becomes a will become finance act so for our examination we have finance act 2023 which is applicable to us finance act 2023 so all the amendments which has had happened in finance act 2023 we have to do that also so we don't only uh, look at income tax act provisions we also look at finance act provisions so we have to understand these things also there are again income tax rules in some of the chapters i tell you how these perquisites are calculated these all are mentioned sorry these all are mentioned in uh, rules that how you have to because in there are different sections where it is written uh, where you have you must have seen that it is written as may be prescribed so th that things are prescribed in rules so if wherever act says in any section that as may be prescribed so as prescribed by rules so you have to understand rules also then notifications central government from time to time they make some changes in income tax so they uh, what they do is they issue notifications so we should know all the notifications circulars and also there are some decisions of court also that we have to understand in final we do various decisions of court but in inter we don't do so many decisions but yes one of the decision i think you should remember that we will do in capital gain chapter manjula jesha right that i'll discuss in capital gain chapter so these all are things are which are components of income tax law you should know this okay then various there are various terms who is an assessee assessee is a person who has to pay tax the person who is earning income and he has to pay tax not only tax if that person has to pay other amount also to the income tax let's say that person has paid the tax but he has not paid the interest let's say interest is also levied on him or any other penalty is levied on him if income tax department has to collect taxes or any other amount like interest penalty etc then that person from that person from whom we have to collect this that person becomes an assessee so in simple word the person who is earning income is an assessee right and also if income tax officers assess any person if they do some assessment on that we will discuss in our chapter that is return of income that how many types of assessments are there so if income tax officers are doing assessment on any person so that person also becomes an assessee so assessee is a person who, from whom any tax or any other sum of money is payable under this act who has to pay income tax or interest or penalty and all right person because here it is mentioned assessee means a person so who is a person only individual can be person or some there are some artificial persons also there are some artificial person also so income tax has also given us a definition of person so in person that person could be a natural person like individual and they could be like huf aop boi association of person body of individual they can be artificial juridical person like temple mosque gurudwara taikis church etc right they can be partnership firm also partnership firm is also assessed as a person right as a firm or a company also could be a person so there are individual huf company partnership aop local authority artist juridical, uh, juridical person so you should know that these are all person if they are earning income they have to pay taxes what is assessment year and what is previous year this is the easy so what is assessment year it is a period of 12 months first you understand it is a period of 12 months and in assessment year we assess the income of the income which we have earned in the last year in last year we say is previous year so in previous year whatever income we have earned we will assess it in the assessment year so assessment year is always a period of 12 months and it follows the previous year after previous year there would be an assessment year so for our examination which previous year is applicable previous year 23 24 is applicable so whatever income which we have earned in previous year 23 24 that is from 1st april 23 to 31st march 2024 whatever income which we have earned we have to assess that income in the assessment year so uh, previous year means the year in which we earn income and the assessment year is the next year where we have to pay the taxes or we have to assess our income so assessment year one thing you should remember assessment year it is also a, always a period of 12 months is previous year is also a period of 12 months this is important the answer is generally yes i'm saying generally why i'm saying generally because previous year is generally of 12 months previous year starting from 23 and 24 but sometimes it could be less than 12 months also how let's say there is a person who has just started his business 
he has just started his business or he has just started his profession before that he was not having any any income before that he was not having any income he has just started a new business or new profession so is it necessary that he will start the business from 1st april the answer is no he could start the business from 1st may 1st june and not even 1st in the middle of the month also he can start their business or profession so in that case the previous year is not of 12 months it can be reduced also if there is any new business or profession which is set up during the year okay and also if there is any source of income which comes for the very first time let's say there is a person for example there is a person mr amit and he was uh, doing ca he was doing ca and in may let's say uh 2024 he gives examinations and he becomes ca so when he will become ca once result will be declared so result will be declared in uh, may june july somewhere in july let's say the result will be declared so when once the result was declared in july 24 he started his uh, job let's say he started his job or he started his practice or profession or business anything so let's say he started his job so before that he was not doing anything let's say he was just uh, studying he was not earning but from july onwards or from august onwards he got a job now he started earning so his previous year would start from this particular date from where he has started his earning right this is a new, new source of income which has come into picture so in from april 24 he was not earning anything may 24 he was not earning june he was not earning and let's say he started earning from july onwards so his previous year will start from july right so it is a very rare situation generally it is a period of 12 months but yes examiner can ask you whether the previous year can be less than 12 months also the answer is yes in these cases it can be less than 12 months also right okay income earned during the previous year is assessed and taxed in the assessment in previous year whatever income will be earned it will be taxed and assessed in the assessment year one very important question can there be certain cases where the income of the previous year will be assessed in the same previous year? Can there be any cases? The answer is yes. Examiner's favorite question. They can ask this question. Generally, we know general law is that in previous year, whatever income we will be earning, that will be assessed in assessment year. But are there any cases where the previous year income is assessed in the same previous year? The answer is very much yes. There are certain cases. Uh, what, uh, in what cases, in what circumstances can it be? Let's say if there is any assessee, uh, which income tax officers believe that he will not be available in assessment year. He will not be available. He will be either uh, gone from, he will be, he will be leaving India forever or he will not come back. So in that case, we will assess the income of the previous year in the same previous year itself. Or there is any non-resident if he will not come back. So these, this is something which is important. So you can mark this important. This is page number 1.4. Right? So please mark this important. So you don't have to remember the section number, but you should know these cases where the income of the previous year is assessed in the same year. So if there is a shipping business of a non-resident, so if there is a, any US company, they are into shipping business. So uh, once they came India, once in a blue moon, they came India and uh, they are now leaving and that uh, we don't know whether they will come back or not so in that case before leaving that uh, before leaving that indian port we will ask them to pay their taxes also so non resident shipping business so it is resident shipping business or non resident it is non resident shipping business okay second is person leaving india with no intention of returning if he is going out and he has no intention of coming back then we will collect the tax from the same pre in the same previous year AOPBY formed for a particular event or purpose. If there is any association of person or body of individual that is formed only for a particular purpose. Let's say if there is any event happening or any function happening and there is two or three person they join together as an AOP or BOI and they will be managing that particular function and for that they will be paid and that function will last for three or four days, right? So after that, uh, for only for four days, they got, uh, they got together and they are doing that particular venture and after that, they will be all divided right so in that case 
because in if we will wait till assessment year there will be no aop or by in the assessment year so in that case we will be taxing them in the same previous year right person likely to transfer property to avoid taxes if there is any person uh, who is uh, has so much of black money and uh, if income tax officer got, get to know about it and if they also get to know that he is just now uh, disposing all his property so that he uh, will not be able to will not be able to recover that tax also so in that case we will go and tax in the same previous year or any business which is discontinued so these are the cases where we will tax the income in the same previous year okay or oh, this is easy what are heads of income we all know there are five heads of income first we'll start with salary then house property pgbp capital gain and ifos okay now it is important and there is an amendment also in the income tax rates so you should know about income tax rates also for individual huf there is an amendment also and in the new scheme which we call now a default scheme there is an amendment also now the income tax has been rate has been changed from the last year in 2024 now we have different income tax rate so for individual huf aop by artificial juridical person we understand that these people these kinds of assessee pay their taxes at the rate on a slab rate basis and for companies and firms they pay tax on flat rate system so in india we have both types of rates slab rates and flat rates but first we'll talk about this and specifically in intermediate examinations you understand that individual is most important you should know about individual they will not ask you uh, questions about partnership firm or companies and all rarely they will ask you the rates and everything but entire uh, your all the questions will cover generally of individual or actually mainly individual okay so these people individual i repeat individual huf aop by artificial juridical person they pay taxes on the basis of their slab rates so and they have two options either they can pay their taxes by using the new scheme that is called new regime and now it is called as a default tax regime and the section number is 115 bac this is one of the important section and if you can remember the section number then it will be good 115 bac it is for the new tax regime which we call it as a default tax regime so these people have an option they can pay their taxes as per the default tax regime also or as per the old scheme which we call it as an optional scheme now we don't call it an old scheme we call it now it as an optional scheme but it is same thing it is old scheme only right so there are two kinds of so if any individual would like to pay their taxes they have an option either they can go for, with the default tax regime or they can go with the old scheme that is we call it as an optional scheme so uh what is the tax rate in the new tax regime this is important and there is an amendment also and certainly question will come even mc can, can come then they, uh, they will ask you that this is the income of an ssc and he is following individual scheme what would be the tax on that so if the individual huf aop by or ajp that is artificial juridical person if they are following default scheme they have to pay rates they have to pay taxes as follows okay so if they have total income up to 3 lakh so till 3 lakh they don't have to pay any taxes if they have total income up to 3 lakh the tax is nil and on next 3 lakh that is from 3 lakh 1 rupees till 6 lakh rupees that is for next 3 lakh they have to pay 5 percent next 3 lakh from 6 to 9 10 percent 9 to 12 15 percent 12 to 15 20 and after 15 lakh 30 percent right so it is a concessional scheme of taxes the answer is yes because then old scheme in the optical scheme after 10 lakh we pay 30 percent but here after 15 lakh we are paying 30 percent right so this is a concessional scheme and how you will learn that it is very easy to learn so see in total income there is a difference of 3 3 lakh and after 15 lakh it is going to 30 percent so first three next three next three next three next three and once you reach 15 lakh it would be your 30 percent so there is a difference of 3 3 lakh and there is a difference of 5 5 percent right so that is easy to remember first it was 0 then 5 10 15 20 going on multiple of 5 once you reach 15 lakh limit that is 20 percent after that it is not 25 it is now direct 30 so you should remember the last one now from 20 onwards it is not going to 25 it is going on 30 right so these are the concessional rate this is default tax regime rate 
earlier it was 2.5 lakh and so now it is 3 lakh okay so this is an amendment and you understand that if a, any person individual huf aob bui is following these particular rates then there are certain deductions there are certain exemptions which will not be way available because we are not uh, giving two benefits to them one benefits we have given is concessional rate so we will take one benefit from them the other benefit is which we are taking away from them is the sacrifice they have to make is they don't have to they can't claim certain exemptions and deductions which we'll be doing in our subsequent chapters in salary what deductions they cannot they will not be getting in house property what uh, for self occupied property they don't get that 2 lakh deductions in PGBP, they don't get section 35 AD and all additional depreciation they will not get. That we will learn in all those chapters. What are the exemptions or deductions which is not available to them? Okay. Second most important thing you should remember is in default tax regime, uh, there would be no benefit for the age also. For senior citizen or for super senior citizen, there will be no benefit. They will be all of them will be paying the taxes if the person is individual HFA, OP, BUI, if the person is individual. Their age is more than 60 years or more than 80 years also, they will be paying tax. There is a similar rate of tax for everyone. In optional scheme, in the old scheme, we have benefit for senior citizen and super senior citizen, but here we don't have any such benefit. So everyone would be treated equally. So this is important thing which you should remember. Got it? Okay. So in optional scheme, what was the tax rate? It was earlier. There is no amendment there. So it was the same as earlier. So up to 2.5 lakh, if the person is following, he say he's saying, no, no, I want to take those. I don't want to sacrifice those exemptions, those, dedu those deduction. I'll be taking that. That would be beneficial for me. So if the person is opting for a optional scheme, that is old scheme. So that rate of tax would be up to 2.5 lakh nil. Next 2.5 lakh, that is from 2.5 uh, lakh to 5 lakh, it would be 5%. From 5 lakh to 10 lakh, actually it is 5 lakh 1 rupees, right? It is 2 lakh 50. 1001 rupees so but we understand that first 2.5 lakh nil next 2.5 lakh 5 percent next 5 lakh is 20 percent and after 10 lakh we have to pay 30 percent see here after 5 lakh you are paying 20 percent and there you are paying 20 percent after 12 lakh so this is concessional and this is not concessional but yes you get certain benefits here you get certain deductions also here so there is a new chapter which is introduced in your uh, syllabus that is income tax. We will do it in the last. That is income tax computation and optimization. Very important chapter and examination. Examiner will short short will be asking questions on that particular point also. Specifically the first question uh, which comes in, of total income. They can ask you which uh, particular scheme would be beneficial for them. So that is income tax computation and optimization. What is optimization means that out of these two options, what will be the most beneficial for him? Should we advise him to go for default tax regime or we should advise him to go opt for optional tax regime? So that is another important question. And one more thing, if the person is following optional scheme and if they are resident individual, and whose age is more than uh, sorry 60 years or more then they will be getting benefit of 50000 that up to 2. Point, generally up to 2.5 lakh they don't have to pay tax but if the person is a senior citizen then up to 3 lakh they don't have to pay tax so there is a benefit of 50000 so up to 3 lakh there is no tax from 3 to 5 this is something which is the same as earlier 3 to 5 lakh 5% 5, 5 to 10 lakh 20 and about 10 lakh it is 30% but the important here thing is that this senior citizen must be a resident and i tell you a very important thumb rule in income tax there is so many uh, benefits which are available to senior citizens but in every case wherever these benefits are available it is important that that senior citizen must be a resident in income tax act we are not going any we are not going to give any special benefits to non resident senior citizens so if a senior citizen is a non resident we will be uh, giving them normal provisions we will not be giving them any special benefits which are available to senior citizen so that senior citizen must be a resident this is important okay this is important resident can be ordinary not ordinary that is okay but that person should be a resident individual. So if a person is a resident individual and his age is 60 years or more, one important thing. We say 
see for our examination the previous year which is applicable is previous year 23-24 so which starts from 1st April 2023 and will go will go till 31st March 2024 so due in this previous year these dates both these dates are included so if a person becomes of age 60 in any of this on any date in this year from 1st April 23 till 31st March 24 if he becomes 60 years of age we will call him as a senior citizen let's say he becomes 60 years his birthday is on 31st March 2024 so we will call him as a senior citizen right right we don't have to see the date of assessment year we have to see of only of previous year one important point also we will give add one more day extra that is 1st April 2024 first april only one day extra not second april first april not second april just first april we will give one day extra also so if a person is becoming a senior citizen on not in the previous year but on first april 2024 we will again consider him as a him or her as a senior citizen right so this we discuss uh, generally we discuss this in our regular lecture why one more day is given but this is a revision i think you will get to know this right so please remember if a person is becoming a senior citizen on first day of the assessment year also that is first april 2024 for our examination then also we will be considering that person as a senior citizen correct so this is important okay and if a person is a super senior citizen that is 80 years or more same thing in, at any time during the previous year, he, uh, that person becomes 80 years or even on 1st April 2024, if a person becomes 80 years or more, then up to 5 lakh nil, 5 to 10, 20 percent and above 10 lakh, it would be 30 percent. Got it? Age must be attained during the previous year or on 1st April of assessment. Not 2nd April, 3rd April. No, it is only on the, we are giving only one day in effect, right? On 1st April of the assessment year. But these benefits will be given only and only in the case of optional tax regime it will be not be given in default tax regime correct okay one more important question which examiner can ask whether an individual such individual huf aob bui can they in one year they can choose optional in second year they can choose default tax regime is it okay with them the answer is yes also and the answer is no also right why it depends upon their pgbp income it depends on PGVP income. If they would like to switch between, if they would like to keep on switching between optional and uh, your uh, default tax regime. So it depends upon the PGVP income. If the per assessee does not have PGVP income, then we, you are free. You are free. In one year, if you find default tax regime is beneficial, you can go for default tax regime. In second year, if you find optional scheme is beneficial for you, then you can opt for optional tax regime. So if you don't have PGBP, we have no problem. You can switch between the two schemes. But if you have PGBP income, if the assessee has a PGBP income, then they cannot switch. Once they have opted, if a person has a PGBP income and once they have adopted default tax regime, they cannot go back. They cannot go back. This is important. Got it? They cannot go back. But the exception here is if in any subsequent year that person does not have PGBP income, if that PGBP ceases, he shuts down his business or he shuts down his profession. If that PGBP income ceases, in that case, he can come back. But unless and until till the time he is having PGBP income, he cannot go back. So once he has adopted default tax regime, you cannot go back. Right. So this was important. It was on the previous page. So, assessee time limit for exercising the option to shift out of the default tax regime if the assessee does not have PGBP income. So, they can change every year. Whenever they will be filing their return, they can change it. They can opt That's which scheme they are uh, opting this year. But if the assessee has PGBP income, once they have exercised the option of default tax regime, once default tax regime was applicable, they have exercised that option, they cannot go back till they have PGBP. Once that PGBP ceases, then they can go back, right? So this is important. Companies and firms, we understand there is flat rate. For firm, it is 30%. Companies, it is 30 also, 25 also. And foreign companies, it is 40 also. That I'll discuss with you. Okay. First, 
Let us discuss a very important point 87A rebate and in default tax regime in new scheme there is an amendment also that will uh, be uh, making this section very important and uh, I am quite sure I am quite sure that one question will be coming from this 87A rebate. I will tell you which question. Okay. First of all this rebate is eligible the person who is eligible is only an only resident individual not even HUF. so this rebate you should remember this rebate is only for individual not for any other SSC and that individual must be a resident it is available in both optional tax regime also old one also and in new one also okay so in optional tax scheme there is no amendment but in new tax regime that is default tax regime there is an amendment so what was an optional tax regime? In optional tax regime, it was if a resident individual whose total income is up to 5 lakh, then they are eligible for rebate. And how much rebate they will be getting? Whatever the tax is there on their income or rupees 12,500, whichever is lower. So you understand? Whatever the tax is, let's say a person is having income of 4 lakh. So you have to calculate tax on 4 lakh or 12,500, whichever is lower, that is the rebate available to them. In new tax regime, Resident individual, if that person is earning a total income, not GTI, I am talking about total income after deductions and all, right? So if total income, in, no, in new tax scheme, we generally don't get deduction of chapter 6 say, except those few sections that ATCCD and ATCCH, there is a section that we, I'll be discussing with you in uh, that chapter of deductions. So, and again, uh, one more section, ATJJJ, that I'll be discussing with you. Okay, so eligible SSE. So resident individual where total income is up to 7 lakh, now it is 7 lakh, there is an amendment over here. So if the total income is up to 7 lakh, then this person can go for rebate. And how much rebate he will be getting? The tax on that income, let's say if a person is earning 6 lakh or 6.5 lakh or even 7 lakh, you calculate tax on that income or 25,000 whichever is lower. So you should remember this amount 25,000 whichever is lower. How this 25,000 is calculated? If you will calculate tax on 7 lakh by following these rates you will get 25,000 see if a person is earning 7 lakh so on first 3 lakh nil on next 3 lakh 5 percent right 3 lakh 5 percent is 15,000 and on remaining 1 lakh 3 plus 3 plus 1 7 it is coming so on remaining 1 lakh 10 percent that is 10,000 rupees so this is 25,000 so this is how we will get, I am getting 25,000 so if a person has a total income of up to 7 lakh, then they can go for rebate, tax on income or 25,000, whichever is lower, right? Now the important point is, if any person who has income of 7 lakh 1,000, will he be eligible for rebate? Will he be eligible for rebate? The answer is no, sir, because we know that up to 7 lakh, then you are eligible for rebate. But if the income is 7 lakh 1000 or 7 lakh 2000 will he be eligible for rebate the answer is still yes the answer is still yes there is some rebate available to him and how that rebate will be calculated for that you should know the concept of marginal relief because it is very similar to the concept of marginal relief so i'll be discussing uh, the concept of surcharge with you and i'll be discussing the concept then with surcharge we'll be doing marginal relief after that i'll be uh, telling you how this rebate is calculated so surcharge, although in our study material, surcharge is discussed in this particular chapter only, but I have uh, been discussing surcharge in a separate chapter. I, and if you uh, look at this book, there is a chapter, second last chapter, I believe it is of surcharge. There I'll be discussing surcharge with you, marginal relief also with you and this concept also of rebate because which is very much related to it is like same like marginal relief the same method which you apply for marginal relief the same method you apply for rebate also so uh, but here in optional scheme if a person is having income of 5 lakh 10 rupees also there would be no that concept there, there will, be, will not be using that concept here it is just 5 lakh if that person is having income of 5 lakh then there is rebate if it is more than 5 lakh there is no rebate at all but here we have that concept in optional tax regime. So that I'll be discussing with the uh, chapter of surcharge. Okay. There are a few points in uh, chapter number one, like agriculture income. Agriculture income I will not discuss in this class. 
I I am I uh, will discuss agricultural income with our PGPP, right? So new tax regime also I will be discussing detail about new tax regime. What are the deductions which are not available? Because in every chapter, with every chapter, I will be telling you that this is uh, will apply only in optional tax scheme. If it will not apply in new tax regime. So in new tax regime, what are the deductions which are not available? I will be discussing in further chapters. In each and every chapter, I will be discussing with you, right? Surcharge we have a different chapter. Agriculture income. Although Institute had, has discussed that agriculture income in the first chapter itself, but I'll be discussing that chap, that particular topic with you in PGPP. Okay. Okay. One more important point. One more important point is there that rebate of 87A is not available from 112A income. What is this 112A? We understand we have a chapter of capital gain. In capital gain, Capital gains are of two types, short term capital gain and long term capital gain, right? If a person, short term capital gain, generally we understand, uh, generally it is if person is transferring their asset before three years, in some cases it is two years, and in some cases it is one year also. That we will discuss, be discussing in uh, the chapter of capital gain. But here, just I would like to give an overview. If a person is selling equity shares, if a person is selling equity shares or equity oriented units, if the person is selling equity shares and equity oriented units on a stock exchange, on a stock exchange, it is written, it is mentioned in the question that it is stock exchange or STT is mentioned, securities transaction tax is mentioned, then we understand that it, this transaction is happening in a stock exchange. So if a person is selling equity shares or equity oriented units on a stock exchange or STT is paid, anything which is mentioned in the question, then we call such short term, we call such short term is as triple one A, that is called triple one A. Other short term is not triple one A, other short term is not, let's say if a person is selling gold after six months, seven months, that is also short term, but that is not triple one A. Triple one A is only and only if we sell equity shares or equity oriented units or units of business stress, business stress is not an in intermediate course, so I'm not discussing that. So, okay, equity shares, equity oriented units, then it is triple one A. Right. So you understand triple one is short term only and only in case of equity shares or equity oriented units. OK. And the rate of tax is 15 percent. Here the rate of tax is 15 percent. Everybody has to pay tax at a rate of 15 percent, whether that person is individual also, HUF, AOB, BOI, artificial judicial person, even partnership firm or companies also. Everyone has to pay tax at a rate of 15 percent. Here we have special rate of tax is 15 percent. Long term capital gain. If that equity shares or equity oriented units, if they are long term, we are selling it after one year, then we call them 112A. We call them 112A. Other long term, we call it 112. So these are three sections which I would like to discuss. These are three sections which I would like to refer over here. So triple one A is short term capital gain on equity shares or equity oriented units. If they are short term, triple one A, 15%. And if they are long term, then 112A. And here the rate of is 10%. Here the rate is 10%. Also, we understand that in 112A, there is, I'll be discussing that in capital gain, that in 112A, if you are having income of, let's say, 5 lakh, 6 lakh or 7 lakh, then we give an exemption of 1 lakh. 1 lakh is exemption, is a flat exemption. So we don't charge on entire 5 lakh. If you have 112A, 5 lakh, then only 4 lakh, we have to pay tax of 10%. If you have income of 6 lakh, just subtract minus 1 and it will be 5 lakh. If you have income of 7 lakh, after one, subtract minus one, and then it would be six lakh. So one lakh is exemption, which is available over there in 112A, but the rate is 10%. And on other long term, let's say if equity shares or equity oriented units, it is 112A. And other long term, if the person is selling land and that is long term, or if, if that person is selling gold or any other capital asset which they are selling, which is not equity shares or equity oriented units on a stock exchange, other than that, it is 112 and the rate is 20%. And this, these are special rates. These are special rates. It is applicable for everyone. Individual HUF, AOP, BY, even partnership firm, companies and all, everyone has to pay these special rates, right? We understand partnership rate is 30%, but 30% is normal income, but we have special income also, right? So I was telling you that this rebate, this rebate of 87A is not available from 112A. What was 112A? Long term equity shares or equity oriented units on a stock exchange or STT, right? So in that case, if a person is having, let's say there is a person 
who is having an income of 6 lakh and he is in new tax regime and this 6 lakh is coming uh, entirely from 112a so he will not be getting repaid so this is uh, one thing which you should remember that 112a is not uh, sorry 87a rebate is not available from 112a right 112a i have written discuss later because this is a part of capital gain okay surcharge is an additional tax which you have to pay let's say for individual if he is earning income of more than 50 lakh then there is surcharge which is uh, which would be applicable if more than 1 crore then 2 crore 5 crore that i'll be discussing with you i've already mentioned that i'll be discussing with you in a separate chapter surcharge and marginal relief okay health and education says so there is a cess of 4% on income tax plus surcharge if applicable you have to add both the things and then you will apply your cess so if the person is uh, having if there is an individual who is not having any income more than 50 lakh so there will be no surcharge so whatever whatever tax we will calculate we will add 4% on it right and if a person is having income which is more than 50 lakh then we will be calculating tax then surcharge and we will be adding both of them then after adding adding them then we will be applying 4% cess on that correct okay and this you know that you have to round off your income also and round off your taxes also so rounding of income is section 288a rounding of taxes 288b even if you don't remember the sections it's okay perfectly fine but you should know that you have to round off your income some person some students make this mistake that they keep on round, uh, rounding off each and every head if they are earning income from salary they will round it off if they are earning income from house property they will round, round it off no you don't have to round off each and every of your heads income you have to round off your total income gti no gti only a total income you have to round it right so please remember that you have to round off your total income and how you will round off you in the multiples of 10 and simple mathematics uh, uh, concept will be followed over here if the last digit is uh, up to 1 2 3 or 4 up to 4 then you have to come back in the previous multiple of 10 and if it is last digit is 5 or more than 5 then you have to further round it off in the succeeding 10 so let's say if your total income is 2 lakh 40000 343 then what you have to make you have to go back so this is 240 340 for right and if this is not 343 but it is 345 or 346 then you have to take it 2 lakh 40000 350 theek hai same concept of mathematics so you have to round off your total income not every head not gti total income you have to round off and you have to round off your taxes also before says and after says after says whatever is your tax payable whatever is your tax payable or tax refundable you have to round off that right same concept will be followed if the last digit is up to 4 then previous multiple of 10 if it is 5 or more than 5 then next multiple of 10 okay taxes on other ssc so partnership firm we understand that the tax rate is 30% llp llp is also a partnership firm once it was asked in an mtp that how llp is assessed llp is nothing but a kind of partnership firm so the tax rate is 30% but on those special income like which we have discussed triple 1a 112a and 112 we have tax rate of 15% 10% or uh, 20% as applicable right so on normal income they have to pay tax of 30% but on other income they have if they have special income they will be paying paying tax at the special rates companies first of all companies they have a flat rate flat rate of 30% flat rate of 30% but if it is not a very big company it's uh, not a very big company whose turnover is up to 400 crore in the previous year 21 22 then that domestic company has to pay tax of 25% so for domestic company it is 30% but for if it is not a very big company the turnover is not more than 400 crore in the previous year 21 22 why we take 21 22 i'm not discussing here we take, uh, uh, discuss in regular lectures but here just remember that in the previous year 21 22 if it is 400 crores up to 400 crores or less than 400 crores then the flat rate would be 20, 25% otherwise 30% there are other rates also 22% 15% also there is section like 115 b aa b a b etc but that is not an intermediate so i am not discussing those sections just remember that for companies domestic companies it is 30% but if it is not a very big company then it is 25% for foreign company you should know 40% for foreign company it's 40% just you remember this rates 
दे कैन कम इन एमसीक्यू बट जनरली इन इंटरमीडिएट क्वेश्चन डजन कम ऑन कंपनीज इट कम्स जनरली ऑन इंडिविजुअल राइट कॉपरेटिव सोसाइटीज अप टू टेन थाउजेंड टेन परसेंट टेन थाउजेंड टू ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड इज ट्वेंटी एंड मोर देन ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड इज दैट ठीक है नॉट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ओके स्पेशल रेट आई हैव डिस्कस्ड ऑल्सो विद यू फॉर लॉन्ग टर्म कैपिटल इंडिया ट्वेंटी परसेंट एवरी वन हैज टू पे ट्वेंटी परसेंट राइट एस टी सी जी ऑन इक्विटी शेयर और इक्विटी यूनिट यूनिट एस टी सी जी दैट इज कॉल ट्रिपल वन एट इज फिफ्टीन परसेंट एंड इफ इट इज नॉट एल टी सी जी इट इज एल टी सी जी ऑन इक्विटी शेयर इक्विटी यूनिट यूनिट एंड इट इज टेन परसेंट बट वन वन टू ए वी डोट गिव रिबेट आउट ऑफ दिस सेकेंड थिंग देर इज एन एग्जामेशन ऑफ वन लैक ऑल्सो वट एवर इनकम यू विल बी अर्निंग इन वन वन टू ए आफ्टर वन लैक देर वुड बी टेक्स विच इज एप्लीकेबल ऑफ टेन In casual income, in your lottery income, game show quiz, etc., you have you know that the rate of tax is thirty percent. And on unexplained income, like unexplained cash credit, unexplained money, unexplained investment, unexplained expenditure, these sections I'll be discussing with you in BGBP. Here, the tax rate is sixty percent. Right here, the tax rate is sixty percent. So these are special rates. Everyone, if person is having income of these kinds of Uh, special income, then they have to pay special tax rate. Let it be because we understand for companies we have twenty five percent, thirty percent. But if they have income in LTCG of one one two, one one two is other LTCG. One one two A is equity shares, equity unit units. They have to pay tax of this LTCG twenty percent, STCG triple one is fifteen percent. It's for everyone, right? So about tax rate are for all SSE, whether they are individual HUF firm companies, everyone. One, they have to pay tax if they are having income of this special type of income. They have to pay tax on special type of rate. Second question, it can come whether it is applicable on new scheme or old scheme. On both the schemes, it is same. It is both the same. It is same. Whether a person is uh, opting for a new scheme that is default, or their person is opting for an optional scheme, these special rates on special income are same in both the cases. Correct. So special rate will apply in respect of the tax regime. And what about those slab rates? This is taxable on that slab rates which we have discussed for individual. That is on other income. That is on remaining income. They have to pay tax. But if they have special income, they have to pay tax like this, right? And there is a special provision also for resident, individual, and HUF. That if it is only for resident, individual, and HUF, I tell you with an example. Uh, let's say. Okay. See, if there is a person is an assessee, Mister K, and he is following in uh, previous year. This is previous year twenty three and twenty four, and uh, he is following default tax regime. Default tax regime. We understand that there is a basic exemption limit. Basic exemption limit of how much? Three lakh. Till three lakh, that that person is not required to pay taxes. Let's say in this year he has income from salary. One lakh. This is computed income. One lakh, and he has income from capital gains. Let's say four lakh, and out of this, rupees three lakh eighty thousand is one one two. This is one one two. That is LTCG. It is normal LTCG. We understand that this is chargeable at twenty percent. Okay. Uh, let me add one more thing also over here. Uh, this is three lakh fifty thousand. It is one one two, and he has twenty thousand rupees as triple one. This is triple one A STCG. We understand that here the rate is fifteen percent. One one two. The rate is this is long normal long term. And the rate is here is we understand twenty percent. We don't have one one two a over here. One one two a that is the rate is ten percent, which is applicable. And he has IOPS, which is lottery income. This is lottery income. And let's say he has income of ten lakh rupees. So total income he has is fifteen lakh. Is he eligible for rebate? The answer is no. In default tax regime, we understand up till seven lakh you are eligible for rebate. And if it is marginally over seven lakh, that we will be discussing in that chapter of surcharge and marginal relief. I'll be discussing that rebate. But here he is not; person is not eligible for rebate. Okay. 
So the question is, this is let's say his total income. This is his total income. So how we will calculate the tax over here? How will be going to calculate the tax? So first of all, we will see whether he has any special income. So a special income is taxable on special rates. So how we uh, proceed with this types of question? First of all, we have to cal calculate. We have to see, determine that whether there is any special income. So first, it should be in this order. It should be in this order. First, you will uh, write LTCG. That is of 112. If you don't remember this 112 section, it's okay. But you should know rate of 10%. LTCG, which is taxable at 20%. Second is triple one a short term, which is applicable at a rate of 15%. And 112A, that is long term on equity shares. This is long term on equity shares or equity oriented units, 10%. It should be in the same order. First, you should write LTCG 20%, then triple one a 15%, 112A 10%. So should we write LTCG and this LTCG together? The answer is no. Please, you should write this. We have to follow this order. Why we follow this order? Again, I'm not discussing over here. We discuss this in regular lecture, not here. Okay. I think yeah, you should you should know this. That how why we stay, take this order. And after that, we say whatever is our casual income. Casual income is taxable at 30%. And if we have any undisclosed income, you will rarely find it. If if you want, you can also skip this. If the uh, in the question it is not mentioned, but still I'm writing it over here. So if there is any undisclosed income, which is taxable at 60% tax rate. So first of all, these all are one, two, three, four, five. These are five special income. First, out of this 15 lakh. You should make this five special income and this is remaining income. The last one is called remaining income, which is we also call it as a, we also call this as a, a normal income. Okay. So out of this 15 lakh, please ask yourself that whether there is any LTCG, which is normal LTC 20%. The answer is yes, sir. Out of this 15 lakh, we have 3 lakh 50,000 as LTCG. So please write over here, 3 lakh. 50,000. Triple one A, is there any triple one A? The answer is yes, sir. 20,000 was triple one A also. Was there any 112A? The answer is no. There was no 112A, right? There is casual income. Yes, sir. 10 lakh is the casual income, lottery income. There is no undisclosed income. Now, what you have to do is you just have to take the balancing figure over here. You just have to take the balancing figure over here. Please don't compute from here that what are my no normal income? No, please don't go that way. You just simply calculate what is the balancing figure. So out of 15 lakh, subtract these all th these things. So subtract out of this 15, subtract 3.5, 20, 10 lakh. So this is 1 lakh 30,000. 1 lakh 30,000 is your remaining income. This is normal income. So in normal income, we will apply slab rates. If this, this person is individual, in this normal income will be applying slab rates. But here we will be applying your flat rates. So what we should do is, so what student will do? So they will... Apply 20% on this. So 20% on this is 70,000. 15% on this is uh, 3,000. Here it is no income. Here it is 3 lakh. There is no income. And on 1 lakh 30,000, we will say, sir, it is less than 3 lakh. So we are not going to apply any tax on this. And this is the entire tax. And we will apply, says 4% over there. This is my tax liability. But, 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 you should first see. What was my basic exemption limit? Basic exemption limit, let's say this person is following default tax regime, that it is 3 lakh. So whether this remaining income is up to 3 lakh, the answer is no. There is some unexhausted, there is some unexhausted basic exemption limit. This particular concept which I am explaining right now, you have to apply only and only in the case of resident individual or resident HUF. This concept which I am explaining to you right now, you have to apply only in the case of resident individual and HUF, not for anyone else. If this person would have been a non-resident, then my first, uh, um, what, whatever I have calculated just now was correct. I have calculated on 3,50,000, 20% is 70,000, then it is 3,000 and so on. That was correct. If this person would have been non-resident, please don't uh, care about this unexhausted limit. You just simply calculate the taxes. But if this person is an individual or HUF, you should know about is there any unexhausted limit? The answer is yes. Because my basic exemption limit is 3 lakh and this remaining amount, normal income which is coming is 130. So there is a difference of 1 lakh 70,000. There is a difference of 1 lakh 70,000. This is unexhausted basic exemption limit. 
and this is applicable in new in old scheme also let's say this person is following a old scheme optional scheme so his basic exemption limit would have been 2.5 lakh so how much is the deficiency 120 right 2.5 minus 130 120 is the deficiency that is called unexhausted basic exemption limit so this unexhausted basic exemption limit provision you will apply only and only in the case of resident individual or hf not for anyone else so here how much is my deficiency one lakh seventy thousand i am taking basic exemption limit as three lakh default tax regime okay so what you can do is you can fulfill this unexhausted limit from these three from these three you can fulfill you cannot take this uh, basic unexhausted basic exemption limit from casual income or undisclosed income only from these three you can fulfill and in the same order first you will see whether 170,000 which I want over here whether it can be moved from LTCG of 20% the answer is if it is yes please move it from there so here we can move it because we need 170,000 which is the unexhausted limit we need it here so we can move it from our LTCG, subtract 1,70,000 from here because we have 350 available. We can easily move 170 out of it. So first move from LTCG 20%. This should be in the same order. LTCG, triple 1A and then 112A, right? We cannot move it from casual income or undisclosed income. First move it from LTCG. So it can easily be moved. Let's say if there would have been just 1 lakh, if there would have been just 1 lakh, so how can you move 170? You can just move 1 lakh out of it. So if we move 1 lakh out of it, so it would be 2 lakh 30,000. Again, there is a deficiency of 70,000. Then we can move it from triple one. We can move it from triple one A. And if we can move 20,000 out of it, still there is deficiency. Then we, we can move from 112A if the, it is available. If it is not available, then what we can do is, can we go in casual income? No, we cannot go in casual income or undisclosed income to get the amount. So for movement, these two will not be used. Only these three and also in the same order. Okay. So first of all, I'll be moving 170 out of it. So if I deduct 350 minus 170, so this is 180,000. It will become 180,000. We don't want to move anything from here because we have already whatever the amount which you require that came from LTCG 170. So here it is 20,000. Okay. So and it becomes 3 lakh now. So now you have to apply your tax rate. So this movement provisions, this concept you will apply only in the case of resident individual tax rate, not for anyone else. Okay. So on 180, you apply 20% tax rate, 36,000. On 20,000, 15%, this is 3,000. 112A, we don't have casual income, 10 lakh, 30% is 3 lakh. We don't have undisclosed. And on 3 lakh, we will apply slab rates and it would be nil. Right? Just add this tax. So this is Texas 3,39,000. Apply 4% cess on it. Is rebate available? No, there is no portion, uh, portion of rebate. The income is 15 lakh over here. 3,39,000, 4% is 13,560. And this will become 3,52,560 got it let me check it once again yes 350 to 560 should we round it off it's not required to round off because it is already in the multiple of 10. so this is how you move this is how the concept of unexhausted basic exemption limit is will be applied but this will be applied only in the case of resident individual or actual right so this is about the chapter number one revision. I hope that you find this revision interesting. Now, uh, what you should do is you must be having your study material or any other book which you follow. Please do those questions also. You should write them. You should have a practice of writing the answers. Let's say I'm not saying that you should uh, do entirely all questions. Let's say if there is 10 questions in your book, you should attempt at least five or four. You should attempt them by writing. It is very important examination that you should have a, a practice of writing, right? So you can easily grab very good marks in your examinations. Okay, let's meet in our next lecture and next uh, lecture would be about residential status. Let's meet there. Okay, bye. Take care.